Welcome back, I'm Pat Schloss. Many episodes ago, I introduced you to the pivot longer function. Pivot longer is a key tool for getting our data to be in a tidy format, where each column represents a different variable. Now, in that episode, I had a table where each row represented a date and each column represented the price for different sized lambs. If I wanted to plot the prices for each size of lamb though, I needed to have a single column for the size of the lamb and another column for the price of the lamb, along with another column for the date. So I could take a, a data frame that was many columns wide and condense it to three columns wide, but would be very long. In the recent series of episodes where I've been discussing Amplicon sequence variants, or ASVs, we have also used pivot longer. We regularly use it to convert a table that has separate columns for each taxonomic rank, things like kingdoms, gen genera, or species, into a tidy format. In the tidy format with the taxonomy data, we have a column that indicates the rank, as well as a column that ind indicates the taxonomic name of that rank, things like Bacillus subtilis or Escherichia coli we would expect to see in the species rank. But sometimes we want the wide format, because that is tidy for the application we're working on. For instance, thinking back to those prices, pricing data, perhaps I wanted to plot the price of light lambs against the price of heavier lambs. In that case, a tidy data frame would have separate columns for the prices of the two classes of lambs, rather than just one. Similarly, in the last episode, I wanted to get the number of ASVs per species. In that episode, we could group by using the species column more easily than if we had a long data table format where we had a column for rank and a column for taxon. The point that I'm trying to make here is that whether a data frame is tidy really depends on the context and what you're trying to do. But how do we get our data into a wider format? Well, in today's episode, I'll show you. The function we'll talk about today is pivot wider. We've actually seen it a few episodes ago. In the episode where we did all the self-joins to build out the NCBI taxonomy for each genome, I kind of snuck it into a pipeline. In today's episode, I'll review Pivot Longer, and then we'll really dig into using Pivot Wider to pull our data back apart to so make it more human readable, so that we can then use the cable function, which will be a new function, from the knitter package, which is part of the R Markdown uh, ecosystem, to make our output look nice in our R Markdown document. Now, even if you're only watching this video to learn more about R and don't know what a 16S R RNA gene is or what an Amplicon sequence variant is or why you, sh you, sh why you should even care, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of today's episode. Please take the time to follow along on your own computer. If you haven't been following along but would like to, welcome. Please be sure to check out the blog post that accompanies this video where you'll find instructions on catching up, reference notes, and the links to supplemental material. The link to the blog post for today's video is below in the notes. In addition, I know we've been having a lot more people watch episodes lately, and I want to reassure you that if you have questions or comments, please be sure to leave them down below in the comments. I do my best to answer everything that comes through. So you'll recall in the last episode, we were working on issue 30. Uh, we accomplished what I had set out to do in this first um, comment that I, I seeded the issue with. Um, but I occurred to me as we were kind of going through that material and developing the R Markdown document, that it would really be nice to see a table that would indicate the number of copies of the ASVs for each of the species, uh, the number of genome sequences for each species, as well as like the average copy number. Um, so, uh, to, you know, the, the plots are great, but sometimes it's nice to have a little bit more context of kind of who we're talking about um, in terms of species, uh, who some of those outlier points are, and attempt to maybe to maybe better understand what's going on in the data. So last time we did not close issue 30. We were still working on issue 30. Um, something that we haven't talked about before, but I can see the history of my previous commits by typing git log. And this then gives me an output showing where I am and where I've been, right? So we can see all these past issues uh, as well as who committed them, right? So it's me on everything. Um, and we see that we're currently on issue 30, uh, and the last commit was to build a faceted plot by ASV rate, by number of genomes, and that this addressed issue 30. So we're gonna add another commit to this before we close it. Um, but again, you can see where you've been. I find this to be really nice, because if, I have, if I've left a project and come back to it, I can quickly run git log to see where I've been, and so I can remind myself of what I've been working on. Uh, to get out of this out this uh, screen, if you type hit the Q key, you'll come back to your prompt. 
we see we're in issue 30. I'm gonna go ahead and open R Studio. So I'll do open Schloss R Analysis, the R Proj file. As R Studio opens up, we see that we're in our project root directory. I'm gonna go ahead uh, back to my files tab and open up uh, the last R Markdown document that we were working on. Um, and you can see all the header material that we're used to seeing at this point. Um, I think my date here is wrong. It's not, wasn't the fifth, it was the 15th, um, judging from the title. So I'm gonna go ahead and update that. And um, this all looks good. Um, so to remind you what we've been looking at in this document, uh, this first header uh, loads the tidyverse as well as the here package, which is really nice for working with uh, paths in um, our markdown documents. We've um, joined together our metadata along with our information about what ASVs belong to which um, genomes. And so that's the metadata ASV data frame that I'll go ahead and load here. Uh, we then had some of this text about the uh, number of ASVs per species increasing with sampling effort. Uh, and we found that it, it does increase with sampling effort. Uh, the V19, the full length, uh, increased much more quickly than the smaller regions. And we created this data frame species ASV where we got the number of genomes, uh, the number of ASVs, and the ASV rate. So the number of ASVs per genome. And this is grouped by the species as well as the region we're looking at. And then this allowed us to generate a plot, uh, which I will go ahead and uh, regenerate here. And this is where we talked about making faceted plots. And so uh, we see what it looks like uh, down here in the bottom right corner. And there's of course things we can make this do to make this look a little bit nicer, but eh, that's cool. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is, yeah, we're gonna come down and I'm going to make a new R chunk. And uh, remember that's the three back ticks with the curly braces with an R in the middle. And then you end the chunk with three back ticks. Okay, so before I go to that actually, um, what I wanna do is step back, I'm probably giving you a headache scanning back and forth like that, um, is to, let's take the ASV, uh, meta, or, I'm forgetting what the file, uh, metadata ASV. Metadata. ASV, and we can see that this is what we typically would think of being in a wide format, right? We've got, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, all of these columns for the different taxonomic ranks. We've been working with the species column, and so we've been, we like this format as it is, right? Because it's much easier to work with the species column than to do like, you know, to filter and then, you know, then do group by. Here I can do um, I can select on that species column and go directly to group by species and I have the data in the format I want. What we've seen before is that we can narrow it, we can tidy the data using the pivot, wide, uh, pivot longer data um, function, right? And so you'll recall that the, we have to give it the columns that we want to uh, pivot longer, that we want to pull together, if you will. And so I'm gonna do kingdom, uh, phylum, class, order, and you've seen me do this uh, in previous episodes without much comment. Uh, I just wanna briefly review it, right? And those are the columns that we're gonna pivot longer. The names of those columns, so names two, are gonna go into the rank column. So we'll get a new column called rank, and the values of those columns will go to, I'll call it taxon. And so again, if we run this, you now see that we've gone from a very wide data frame to a much more compact, uh, tidy data frame. So it's much longer, right? So this has almost 900,000 rows, whereas this other version had 100,000 rows, right? Um, but you'll see that we have a column for rank and taxon. And so this is pivot longer. Um, another way that we could have done this, uh, if you didn't want to type out all that stuff, um, would be uh, to, uh, to what I say, use a negative approach. Uh, so we could do pivot longer. And actually, you know what? I'm gonna copy and paste this down because much of the syntax is the same. And so instead of telling it which columns 
to pivot together, to, to join together, I'm going to tell them which ones not to bring together, right? So that would be like genome ID and um, region, ASV, and count. Okay, and so those all need negative signs. And the negative means don't include this, right? And so running this, we then get the exact same output that we had previously, right? And so which way you go is really up to your, your preferences, uh, whether you're a positive person or a negative person. Um, I kind of like listing out the things I want rather than things I don't want, because if the data frame, the input changes somehow and there's a new column that's added, um, being explicit about the columns I want um, kind of allows me to ignore that extra information. Whereas if there's an extra column added, then I would probably need to add it to perhaps be ignored uh, in this negative approach, right? So again, it's up to you. So this brings it together. What if we wanted to then pull it back apart, right? And so what we could think about would be to say, um, let's call this tidy. Okay, so to take this narrow data frame and make it wide, we want to use pivot wider. And what we can do is tidy and pipe that to pivot wider. And we will then say, take the names from, and this uh, is going to be coming from the rank column because those values oh, in uh, the rank column, like kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, um, are going to be the new column names. And the values of those columns, we're going to set with values from, and that is going to come from the taxon column. And what we see now is that the output is basically the same as metadata ASV with one small difference, and that's that the count column in metadata ASV is at the very end, and in um, our wider version, it's before the phylum or between the kingdom column, right? So otherwise, it's the same exact data frame, uh, same number of rows, same number of columns. It's good to go. So this has been a brief introduction or a review of pivot longer and pivot wider. Uh, remember that long uh, makes it long and narrow. Pivot wide makes it wide uh, but short. In general, R prefers uh, narrow, so not a lot of columns. Uh, and if you, I mean, you can throw hundreds of thousands of rows at it, uh, no problem. But you throw hundreds of thousands of columns at R, and it, it struggles. So, but anyway, um, let's think back to our issue now, and what we want to look at is this uh, data frame species ASVs. And again, we want uh, a table that has the species name the uh, number of genomes, the average number of RNs, and then the number of ASVs across uh, genomes for each region of the 16S RNA gene. Okay. So sometimes I like having a little mission statement like this at the top of my code chunk so that I know what I'm doing here. And again, if I come back to it, it's easy for me to see what I've done. So again, species ASVs, we see that we have the region, uh, the species, the number of genomes, the number of ASVs, and the ASV rate. So basically what I want is I'm going to take my names from <laughs> uh, the region column, and then I'm going to separate out then the number of ASVs for each of those regions. I don't care about the ASV rate, uh, so maybe what I'll, where I'll start was, is with a select. And we'll start with uh, species, region, and genomes, and and ASVs. Right, so that gets rid of that rate column, and now I'm going to pivot wider. Right, pivot wider, and I'll say names from equals region values from is going to be n ASVs. Good. And so now we see that we've pulled it apart, right? We've made it wider. And so it's much easier for me to see that Archobacter poisonous has like one genome and one ASV across all the genomes. Um, so I see I, I don't have the average number of RN copies in here, so I'll need to go back and add that. 
Uh, something I like to do sometimes with these big data sets where there's you know 5,000 rows is to throw in a test case. So I'll add filter uh, species equals equals Escherichia coli. And so I see that it's got 958 genomes and all these copies, okay? Another thing that I might do uh, is look at the tail, the back end, and here I see something weird, <laughs> uh, that I've got an NA column in here for uh, Vibrio parahemolyticus. Uh, so maybe what I'll add is a sort uh, or range so I'm going to range by species, and we'll tail that, um, and let's head it. Huh, I wonder what happened to that one. <laughs> Maybe what I'll do is I'll make sure, I'll see what's going on, um, not head, tail. So Vibrio parahemolyticus, and so I will throw that into my filter here. Let's see what this looks like. So what's going on is that we have two rows in here actually for Vibrio parahemolyticus. And that's because if you recall way, way, way back when, um, we tend to have more genomes represented for the subregions than for the full length. Um, for whatever reason, I think there were maybe like 20 extra, um, six or 20 or so um, V19 full length genes that were missing. Um, you know, perhaps ends of the sequences got truncated somehow. And so in this case, it seems that there was one, um, or there's, yeah, one that uh, is different. So there's really 33 genomes. So what I'd like to do is I can modify this. But what I want to show you um, is that because, so the, what's going on here, right, is that if you think about what we had here, um, and let me th throw the filter up here for this uh, parahemolycus, is that what we see is that this is the Vibrio. We've got the four regions, so we've got four rows, and we've got different number of genomes for those four regions, right? And so what it's trying to do is take these regions to make four columns, and it's pulling apart the four ASVs. But the problem is that this is V34 with 33, 33 genomes, and this is V19 with 32. And so because these aren't the same, it makes separate rows, right? And so we see this then in, um, in this next step with the pivot wider, right? And so if n genomes were 33 for both of these, then they'd be on a single row, um, but they're not, right? So let's let's see about fixing that. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to group by species, and uh, I'm going to then say mutate. So I don't know if we've seen this before, but you don't have to run summarize after group by. So we can mutate within each species, right? And so a mutate is gonna change a column for each species separately, right? And so what I can then do is n genomes equals, and I'm gonna say max n genomes, right? And and now uh, what I wanna then pipe that into is I'm gonna do an ungroup, to ungroup uh, at the species level. And now what we see is that it comes through and it gives us a single row back, right? And again, if we'd have put this filter um, up a Above here, uh, let's say here, we'd see that they all have the same number of genomes. And so the number of genomes, the species names are all the same. Um, and those then can be collapsed into a single row with then four columns for each of the regions. So good, that works great. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that filter and remove that for now. And we look at that. Great. So something that I said was missing was the average number of copies from um, the uh, uh, average number of copies of the operon in each genome. So I'm going to come back up here to species ASVs where I'm defining all these things. And I'm going to make um, a new column in my summary output 
called nRRNs. And this is going to be, um, let's see where we are at this point. So I'm going to highlight these three rows and look at the output. And I think I dropped out the count. And so what I want to use is the count. So if I sum up the count, right, um, that's the number of times each ASV, so this ASV shows up three times in this gamma proteobacterium for the V19 region. And so if I then add up the total number of operons, which is the count, for each species, so that would be, say, sum count, and then divide by n genomes, that will give me the average number of copies per genome and the average number of RRNs, right? And so if I look at species ASV, oh, this takes a couple seconds to go. We now see that we have N genomes and ASVs and RRNs. And so that looks good. Um, now, if we come back down to our chunk here and run it, let's see if we get that column. And let's see, oh, and I uh, missed N ASVs here. So I want to put N RRNs, run that. And we get the same problem again. <laughs> and again, that's because there's probably one E. coli genome out there that, or one or two, um, that have, um, that maybe have eight copies rather than seven copies. Um, and so that's why we see a subtle difference there. Um, I'm not looking for like a precise number. I just want it to be the same number. <laughs> um, I mean, these genomes all have the same number of copies. They vary a little bit, again, because of the operon or the gene detection algorithm that's being used. And it seems to be very good. Um, so something I want to show you briefly, uh, and this reminds me, is the values, um, value fill, I believe. Um, and so let's give that a shot. So there's an argument, and I'm spacing on it. So pivot. Let's look at the help. And let's see. Um, values fill. So ah, I get value fill. OK, so if you do value fill, then when it makes an NA value like it did in this case, instead of an NA, it plugs in a 0. And so uh, depending on whether or not um, you want it to be an NA or a zero or what the data represent, uh, you decide what you want that values fill to be. So sometimes I work with tech, um, so like count data, right? So how many times do each of these taxa show up in a community? And if I have it in a tidy frame framework, I might, might remove all the cases where it's a zero, but then when I go back to wider, but they need to be a zero because it's like a structural zero, right? It's a, uh, it wasn't detected, it should be a zero count. So uh, in this case, I don't think values fill, I mean, we're gonna get rid of this. <laughs> so that should go away. But I wanted to briefly show that you can tell uh, pivot wider what that value should be. So how do we fix it? Well, I'm gonna do the similar thing that we did um, here, where we're gonna say nRNs equals max nRNs. That looks good. Um, and now let's run it. And now we see that again, um, if I put this filter um, back, say here, that uh, the species values are all the same for Escherichia coli, the number of genomes is all the same, the number of RN copies is all the same. So those three columns uh, will be collapsed into one row, and then it's going to be the regions, the four regions, and the four NASVs that are going to be uh, pivoted wider. Great. So excellent. And I am going to remove this output of E. coli. And I will call this um, um, wide, uh, I'll call it a count table. All right. What I'd like to do then is to output my count table. And there's a handy package um, called cable that we can use. And what I want to remind you is that we can do count table, and we've already seen this here, uh, the arrange function, right? And so say I want to arrange uh, by n genomes. 
This will be an ascending sort, uh, starting with those that have one copy. Uh, if I want the descending sort, I use DESC, and this should put E. coli up at the very top. And so we see that E. coli, Salmonella, Bordetella, Pertussis, uh, these occur at the top, right? And so this is, you know, these are uh, genomes that we have a lot of data for. And so we can see um, that like E. coli has more ASVs than genomes, um, but it also has about seven copies per genome, which is great. Uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis only has one operon, um, but has 11 ASVs across those 180 genomes, right? So that's a bit of a different story than we see with E. coli. We can then also uh, look at the top N, and we can look at the top N uh, where we say we want N, the top N of, um, say we want, uh, let's do let's do 10, and we want to tell it what columns, so we'll say N genomes, top 10, and the output doesn't really change except we only have 10 rows in our data frame now. The package that we're going to use is called, or the function is called cable, K-A-B-L-E, and this is part of the uh, knitter package, which isn't um, automatically loaded in my experience. So I'm going to go ahead up here and put in library um, knitter, K-N-I-T-R. I'll run that to make sure it's loaded. Come back to the bottom here and run this. And what you'll see when we run this is that we get a table. And this is actually the markdown format of a table. Um, and so that's pretty nice, right? Um, there's all sorts of things that you can do with cable. Uh, there's another package. Um, I'll say C also uh, cable extra. Maybe it's cable extra uh, for extra bells and whistles that you can throw on to your table. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and make this into a pipeline. And let's see. We'll pipe this to cable, and we can give it some... Um, some arguments to make it look maybe a little bit nicer. So I'll say caption is the 10 uh, most commonly sequenced species. And so if we run this, then we get a caption on our table. Um, another thing I see here in this NRNs column is that we have a lot of significant digits. So I could also say then digits equals two and this will then trim it to only two digits to the right of the decimal point, which looks pretty nice. And go ahead and save that. And if I knit it, while this is running, it's a reminder to go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Be sure you click on the bell so you're notified when the next episode is released. So if you kind of scan down through here, and again, this is markdown format, uh, you see the table is outputted here. Um, and it actually puts the caption at the bottom. With that cable extra package, uh, there's all sorts of things you can do to maybe make uh, the output a little bit more attractive. There's other th arguments that you can use in cable uh, to adjust kind of the, the spacing of the column. Um, I believe that's a line. Um, and then you can kind of say left, center, or right. So we could say um, as a string, right? So we could do R, C, L, um, and then let's do C, 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 C. And so this then puts the first column on the right, the second column in the center, the third column on the left, and these others are centered as best it can. But I like the default, um, thought that was pretty nice. So we'll come back to our uh, terminal and I'm gonna go ahead and do make exploratory 2020 10 uh, 15, uh, markdown. This will again run like we saw before. If I do a get status, I see that I've updated my R markdown. I've created a new markdown file. That figure didn't change at all. So I'll go ahead and do a git add exploratory uh, 2020 10 15, all that. And then I'll get commit to add a table showing counts of most abundant species, closes number 30, 
and then get checkout master and get merge um, the issue branch, issue 30. Our studio is complaining in the background. I'm going to ignore it for now. Get push. And yeah, it, it thinks it deleted it. Uh, do I want to close this file now? Sure. We'll go ahead and close this. Go ahead and close our studio and return to my issue. I see it's um, it's built in both commit messages, right? And if I come back to my code, exploratory, and then my markdown file, I can look down, I see my nice figure. It looks better in this larger space. And this is what my table looks like. Um, for me, again, these types of tables are game changers. Uh, back in the battle days before I knew about R Markdown and Cable, I would manually enter these numbers into Microsoft Word. Um, if, say, a new data, a new version of the database came out and they updated what was in there, I would then have to come back in and manually change each number. It was just so tedious. But with this, I don't have to change anything, right? Um, it's, it's really nice and it's really convenient. Um, again, you see the caption is down here at the bottom. I'd probably prefer to have that up here at the top. You can play around with that cable extra package um, to learn more about how you can change that. And we'll probably do a deeper dive on that in a future episode. So again, please be sure that you subscribe to the channel, like the video. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave a comment below in the notes. Tell your friends about this. Um, I'd love to see what you're doing with your R Markdown documents. Have you ever made a, a table in R or wondered how you could do that? Give it a shot with cable and see what you can do. Also, remember that whether or not your data is in a tidy format really depends on what you're trying to do. We can make our data more narrow using pivot longer, and we can make it wider using pivot wider. So give those functions a shot, play around with them and see how you do. Keep practicing, and we'll see you for another episode of Code Club.